Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 165, Storytime, Narrative Adventure Games for Kids. I am Sean, with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night question and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Thanks for joining us, especially those of you here live in our chat room. So tonight, we've got someone looking for some narrative adventure-style board games to play with their six-year-old, and we've got a number of great game recommendations for them. Then we review one of those recommendations with Chronicles of Avell from Rebel Studio. We wrap up with a solid week in review, including plays of Lost Ruins of Arnak, Chronicles of Avell and its expansion, our first play of Quacks of Quedlinburg with the Herb Witches expansion, Imperial Settlers, Codename Duet, and the very start of a new Charterstone campaign. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment from Bob Lai about our Robotech topic from last week. You doubtless enjoy the book Macross, Perfect Memory, an import from Japan, which is chock full of character illustrations from various angles and probably story data. It's all in kanji, akin to the Star Trek encyclopedia. Well, thanks, Bob. That does sound cool to check out, though an English translation would definitely be more useful to me. Um, unlike some Robotech fans I know, I didn't actually bother to take courses in Japanese to enjoy my anime more. Well, next, a comment on our Chronicles of Avil unboxing from Joanna Pikarska on Board Game Geek. They wrote, thanks for such a detailed unboxing. Well, thanks, Joanna. Uh, or you're welcome, Joanna, I guess is more appropriate. Uh, what I dig most about this comment is that it means that there are people indeed watching our unboxings on Board Game Geek, which at least justifies the time I take to import them over there. So that's always good to see. As for Avel or Avel, however you're supposed to pronounce it, stay tuned because we're going to be talking about that game quite a bit tonight. Now, finally, we've got a comment going back to the episode and article where Sean talked about the supers RPGs he's been reading and what each, makes each stand out from each other. Mark Knights writes, It is likely that I will be playing a supers game in the coming few weeks, so it was good to take a look at what's out there. Honestly, my favorite Supers game is an Australian game right out of the 80s. It's the first game I ever bought for $12 in its box set form. It is Super Squadron. It is super random, has lots of different systems at play, but it is slick and offers great variability in characters. I've never come across a game that gives the breadth of play that it does. Mind you, Playing it as written meant you could come out with a character with one power, which was enhanced charisma, while another player might randomly roll Superman-like powers. But I like games like that. I will give you that Spectaculars intrigues me, and to be honest, so does Mutants and Masterminds, so thanks for the post. Well, I gotta say, Super Squadron sound interesting. I'd love to find a copy of the 1984 box set, if it was a reasonable price. Right now, it's at about 80 bucks on Noble Knight. Uh, and there's some pricey ones on eBay as well. Now, I actually found an article from the designer of the game indicating that they were working on a second edition mm. in a 2016 issue of RPG Review. But alas, no more seems to have come of that. So who knows? Now, as far as new games, if you're playing face to face, I think there's probably enough randomness in Spectaculars to give you the feeling you're looking for. And since it's quite the narrative system, the breadth of play is very much up to your group. Mutants and Masterminds is certainly a crunchy step up from Spectaculars, mm -hmm. but I would actually suggest taking a good look at Villains and Vigilantes as the alternative. It has all those juicy tables for all the randomness in developing a character and powers, and I suspect you'll hit a lot of the same feels you were getting from Super Squadron including some really reasonably priced adventures to be found for it on drive through oh. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night's questions. Tonight's question comes from Craig Kennedy, posted on Facebook to ask, what would you recommend 
for a narrative adventure game that a six-year-old could play. I'm thinking of either Mice and Mystics or Stuffed Fables. Well, thanks for the great question, Craig. So quickly, I'll just say, of those two, Stuffed Fables is the better choice. Interestingly, I tried playing Mice and Mystics with my girls when they were right about that age. While they enjoyed it, the game was honestly too much for them. There was just too much going on, too many things to track, and too many options. The only reason that it worked is that mom and dad pretty much held their hands, and the main thing they did was roll dice and tell us what the results were. Now, Stuff Fables is a much simpler game that also features a more kid-friendly story and theme. My kids were more into mass market kids games at that age, which unfortunately don't tend to feature too much of the narrative or adventure focusing, focusing more on the basic skill development yes. instead. Now, due to the fact Craig mentioned Mice and Mystics and Stuff Fables, I'm going to assume that they're mainly looking for board game suggestions. So tonight's list is going to reflect that. That said, just in case they're open to the concept of role-playing games, I do have a few recommendations there as well. And while at least one of the board games I'll be mentioning, actually a couple of the board games I'll be mentioning, do have some RPG elements in them and definitely some storytelling elements. The other important thing to note before we start, every kid is different. Yeah. And you know your kids better than we do. Having two kids, both of us have two kids, yeah. we know very well how different they can be and how one kid's progression can mm -hmm. vary from the other. Especially at this age, your kid's abilities could be very different from another six-year-old. Yes. And at this age, at least as far as gaming is concerned, board gaming is concerned, tabletop gaming, uh, the biggest skill that is going to be a variable here is the ability to read. This is going to be a big factor in which games they'll be able to enjoy and how much they'll enjoy them. Now, I made this list assuming that the child in question has at best a rudimentary reading level, and if any, and that the table would be helping them. So the adults at the table or older siblings or whatever would be working with them and coaching the kids playing. They wouldn't just be able to take the game and go play it in the other room, for example. As usual for these game recommendations lists, the following <clears throat> games are in no particular order. Nope, not at all. Though, like, there's a theme kind of in a way, and I kind of picked them out based on my shelves. But so number one, uh, we're going to start off with Stuff Fables, right? I mentioned this just a few seconds ago in a direct replay to, reply to Craig's question. And, but I really do strongly recommend this story-based game for younger kids for a few reasons. For one, the story is much more kid-friendly when compared to Mice and Mystics and some of the other storybook games. You are playing a young child stuffed animals we're going to be guarding her during her first sleep in their big girl bed. This, of course, leads you to battling the monsters from under the bed and getting sucked into their world and on an adventure that features a lot more than just battling bad guys. Now, two things that worry me about this game and playing with a six-year-old is that there is a lot of reading at each chapter. So like the introduction to the chapter is basically a storybook. And the game is quite long, usually taking over an hour to two hours to play just one chapter, one page of book. So your kid has to be willing to be read to or read and keep focus for a long period of time. I know many kids that don't have the passion for that. Now, that said, as long as you have somewhere to keep the game set up, I don't see any reason you would have to finish a full chapter every time you sit down and play. You should be able to basically stop and say, you know what, the next time it's mom's turn, we're going to stop here and we can play more tomorrow. Now, once you do finish Stuff Fables, there's also a big box expansion called Oh Brother that was released in the middle of the pandemic. So not a lot of fanfare about this one, but it includes a totally new story, new challenges, new enemies and new fables to tell. Now, if you manage to get through both of those, that's where I would recommend perhaps looking into Mice and Mystics for a similar storybook system with a little more crunch to it and a little bit more adult story. Well, not even adult, older kid story. There, there, there's kidnapping and stuff involved instead of stuffed animals battling dolls. So that would be my recommendation for next step. And by the time you get through all that, your kid's probably not six anymore anyway. So they'll probably be able to enjoy the game even more. Well, that was Stuff Fables and its expansion, Oh Brother. Now, next, I want to move to a game or rather series of games that don't have either of these problems. No tons of reading, no long playtime. This is Rory Story Cubes. 
Now, Rory Story Cubes are a set of custom dice with symbols on them instead of numbers. And they come and need their dice sets of six or eight, and I don't remember off the top of my head, even though I've got three packs behind me. Um, they're sold in theme sets, so you can get like actions, voyages, clues, as well as now they have licensed packs, like you can get Batman, Star Wars, and Doctor Who. Now, each set comes with a number of games you can play, which all involve the players telling a story, improvising. Sometimes together, where you're telling a joint story where like you're going to use a die, then the next player has to incorporate another die, and then the next player has to incorporate a die. Other times, you're rolling your dice for yourself and trying to make a story of your dice and so on. I personally found Rory Story Cubes to be fantastic to play with our kids, even when they were younger than six, due to their love of storytelling. Most kids are going to recognize symbols at a young age and be able to tell you fascinating things all about the little stick man on the die. We found the reaction, or, sorry, restrictions added by the cubes actually were fantastic, as opposed to um, just telling a full improv story. It actually worked as inspiration for my girls instead of a limitation by having to use the dice as opposed to just sitting down and having them tell a story. Sometimes a little bit of structure is all you need. Mm -hmm. And that was Rory's Story Cubes. Now, sticking with improv storytelling, but adding more game to it, my next game is Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins. Now, despite having the D&D name on the box and featuring D&D creatures and locations, this game is nowhere near as complicated as the full role-playing game. It's honestly not even really a role-playing game. It's more of an improv experience and even more of an improv experience than even a, a real game. Now, what I do recommend here is if you've got a non-reader, you let the readers take turns being the GM, because that's one of the things in the game, the GM role rotates. Just skip over that for the non-readers and let them play their characters and describe their characters' actions and roll the dice. Now, while I didn't introduce this one to my kids until they were older, I am certain I would have played this with them and they would have loved it when they were younger had it been out. Now, for a lot more information on this game and why I don't really recommend it for older kids or as an introduction to Dungeons & Dragons, check out my review through our podcast, the blog, or YouTube. And that was D&D Adventure Begins. Now, for a dungeon crawler with a lot more game to it and removing the improv storytelling aspects, I would actually recommend Hero Quest now that it's back in print. This is the classic Games Workshop board game that I grew up playing. Now, the only real reading required here is on the part of Zargon, the player playing the adversary, and for the spells that the elf and wizard have to cast. So have your non-reader play the Dwarf or the Barbarian, and you should be good on that count. Now, while your kids may need help with strategy and how to play the rules and maybe going shopping, they're going to love seeing the 3D components on the boards, exploring the dungeons, playing with the miniatures, and rolling dice to battle monsters. A nice touch on this is the dice use symbols. You don't even need to count or add up pips when playing this game. I know many parents who have introduced their younger kids to Hero Quest over the years, starting at very young ages in some cases. And that was Hero Quest, once more available new in stores. Yes, new in stores. Now, sticking with the theme of adventure, but going back to cooperative games, next I want to suggest Chronicles of Avil. This is a four player tower defense game where players collect equipment through a unique touch based bag pulling system, explore a hex map, and prepare to defend the castle from a horde of monsters and the beasts. Now, some of the things a young kid will really enjoy is getting to draw and color their own character, create heraldry for the character, the very cool inventory system, and the whimsical fantasy world, the non-threatening monsters in this game. Now, the cooperative nature means players can easily coach kids having difficulty. Now, our family has really been enjoying this game, and we've honestly had just as much fun playing with kids as with other adults. This is up there with Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters as one of the best kids games I've ever played, bar none. Now, learn more about Chronicles of Avil later in the show, as it's our featured review tonight. And that was Chronicles of Avil, which isn't quite available in North America yet, oh. but should be soon. Now, speaking of ghost fighting treasure hunters, any long-term fan of the show knows I can't make a kid's game list with including this great cooperative game. 
Now, there isn't a lot of story in this game, but it does have a story-ish theme, and it's got that adventure side. You are sneaking into a haunted mansion, battling ghosts, and trying to collect a number of treasures and get them out of the house. Now, this uses the popular cooperative mechanic of everyone does something, then something bad happens. And in this case, the bad is the house filling with ghosts. If you ever get three ghosts in the same room, they become a haunt. And once you get too many haunts, the players lose. Now, along with this one, there is also the Creepy Cellar expansion that I think makes a great game even better. It adds some new twists while making the game a bit easier due to some randomness mitigation that was uh, badly needed. No way. And that, like almost every list of children's games, is <laughs> Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. I need non-cooperative kids games, and then I can't, you know, somehow wedge it in there. Now, my final board game for tonight is another cooperative one that actually has a bit in common with Avil, as that it also uses bags. Though this time it's a bag builder, kind of like a deck builder, but with a bag, and that is Talisman Legendary Tales. This is a scenario-based campaign game where players are exploring, fighting bad guys, and trying to complete quests on a very tight time limit. Now, the game uses bag building where each asymmetric character gets their own bag with their own set of little chips in it. Fights are done by drawing tiles from your bags, hoping to pull the right symbols, depending on which monsters you fight. Now, as you defeat monsters, you can also earn more items, which then get added to your bag. Now, unlike Avil, the tokens in this one are all the same size and shape. So this doesn't have that feeling thing. It's just using the bag as a random element where you're pulling random things. This features some great, great cooperative rules where you can actually pull from another player's bag. So if your wizard gets in a fight and it's against an orc and you need the fighter's help, you can get the fighter to pull from their bag to help. There's a lot going on in this game, though I will admit for Talisman fans, this is pretty far detached from the original board game. Well, that was Talisman Legendary Tales, not just Talisman. Yes. Next, I want to highlight a couple of actual role-playing games, actual story games that I think are great for kids, starting with Mermaid Adventures. Now, this was the first role-playing game I introduced my personal kids to, and it was around that age period. Now, this is a very kid-friendly role-playing game that uses a really simple dice pool mechanic tied to only three stats, where the big thing it encourages players to do is to come up with reasons to use their best stat to solve things and solve things without fighting or combat. You also have unique mermaid abilities for all the different mermaid types because they're not just fishmen in this. You've got shark men and, and, and um, I can't draw a complete blank, octopus women and so on. You have all kinds of different sea creature, mer creatures. And you're trying to use your abilities and your items to try to overcome problems. And the more things you have on your side, the more dice you roll. Now, the thing with this one, and this is an unfortunate caveat I have to add, is that you want to find the first printing of Mermaid Adventures and not the second printing, which is actually a source book for the PIP system, which is much less kid-friendly. Now, find out more about both versions of this game over on the blog. And that was Mermaid Adventures first edition, not the newer PIP system rules, which aren't, again, aren't as kid-friendly. Next up, I have Hero Kids. Now, this is a role-playing game specifically designed to be played by kids ages 4 to 10. So it's right in that right wheelhouse. Now, this is very much a generic fantasy system set up to be a stepping stone to more traditional fantasy role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder. Now, this also uses a D6 dice pool systems, features short one hour or less sessions, 10 different types of heroes you can play, and so on. Now, if I had known this existed at the time, I certainly would have played this with my girls. And that was Hero Kids. And now we have some honorable mentions. So the first one I found with doing research for this topic, looking at various other people's lists and game recommendations for, for storytelling and and adventure games for kids, and it's Ebu E E B O O storytelling cards. And as soon as I saw those, I was like, "Oh, these are like Rory Story Cubes, but instead of being dice, it's a full deck of cards, all featuring whimsical artwork." And it wasn't just like one image; there was a bunch of things going on, like a bunch of rabbits in a carriage, and there's wind blowing. So there's multiple things you can pull from, and 
I was thinking this is cool. And it has, again, a variety of different improv storytelling games where you're trying to play the cards out of your hand or you're trying to collect them or you're drafting and passing to other players. And I got to say, the main reason I wanted to bring this one up is also because looking at these pictures, I was struck with the thought that you could do this with any artwork heavy game that you already own. Dixit and Mysterium being the two that obviously came to mind for me for the whimsical artwork. So this would be a great way for a gamer parent to use a game they already own to make a kid's improv game experience. And that's Ibu Storytelling Cards. Next, I have Andor, the fan family fantasy game. In a way, not to be confused with Legends of Andor, though it is based on this. This is a simplified version of Legends of Andor series of games, which honestly are fantastic cooperative puzzle games from Cosmos that I strongly recommend the adults check out if they're looking for a cooperative fantasy adventure. Well, Andor, not Legends of Andor, just Andor is a cooperative fantasy game where everyone's going to take on a role of a character whose asymmetric and unique abilities who are on epic quest that features rescuing a pack of wolf cubs before the dragon reaches the castle. Now, this one looks great. Uh, it says eight plus on the box, but I've noticed all board game geek has it set as recommended at six plus as a fan of Andor. This looks fantastic. If my girls were younger, I would probably pick it up, but now they can play the full game. And that's Andor the family fantasy game. Now my last one tonight I think is an important one that I wanted to make sure I put on the list, and this is Starport. Now, this is a role-playing game that's mashing fantasy and sci-fi. You've got dragons and you've got spaceships. You've got outer space and you've got, you know, the, the fairy glens. This is doing something completely different from pretty much every other game on the list, including the role-playing games and the board games, because this game features zero reference to any shooting, hitting, slashing, or fighting of enemies. Now, it's designed for kids aged 5 to 12, and there's another one that I wish was around when my girls were younger. I love the fact that they have removed combat, so there will be conflict, but no combat in the game whatsoever. And that was Starport. Now, I actually have an honorable mention here for <laughs> Amazing Tales by Martin Lloyd. Now, while I haven't played Amazing Tales, I have played with Amazing Heroes, the supers version of this system, and I can say that it's very easy and straightforward for a parent to guide their children through adventures with, with the parent nice. being the GM. And that was Amazing Tales by Martin Lloyd. And that's it for our list of great narrative and adventure games for playing with a six-year-old. Now we're here. Oh, and for us. You, you froze. You want to try that oh, again? Sure. <laughs> We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our review of Chronicles of Avell from Rebel Studios, who we have to thank for sending, sending us a review copy of this game. Note, in addition to talking about the base game, we will also be letting you know what you get with the Adventurer's Toolkit expansion and Heroes Treasure promo pack. So Chronicles of Avel was designed by Chemik Kowiak and features artwork from Bart Walme Kordowski. It was originally published by Polish manufacturer Rebel Studio in Poland and is coming soon to North America. Now, right now, you can find it up for pre-order at most Canadian online stores for a price around 50 Canadian or 65 for a bundle with the expansion promo pack and Meeple stickers. Now, it's this bundle that we're going to be talking about tonight because that's what we were sent. Now, oddly, I haven't seen this available on any U.S. sites as of yet, so it looks like it might be coming to Canada first. And I will say the expansion for the game is small but useful enough that it's really probably best to get it in the bundle if you can. So in Chronicles of Avil, players take on the role of brave heroes attempting to defend the lands of Avil and the health stone from various monsters and the beast, which will be summoned when a meteor crashes into the land. In this cooperative tower defense game, players will explore a hex map, 
defeat monsters and equip their heroes using a unique bag pulling mechanism that uses your sense of touch to help you get the items you want. This is all done in preparation for the end game where the monsters will rush the castle. For a look at what you get in the box for Chronicles of Avel, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, over all the quality here is honestly top notch. Some of the best I have seen at a game targeted at families and younger kids. You've got two layered player boards, thick cardboard, clear rules, fantastic artwork, and a unique fantasy setting where all of the gods are moved. That all of this really makes this game stand out above many other family weight games. As you learn about the gameplay, you'll understand why the component quality mm -hmm. makes more of a difference than you might think. Now, how about you give us an overview of how to play Chronicles of Avel? All right, you start a game of Chronicles of Avel by building the map. This is done by first placing the castle and three set hex tiles around it, though they're in random order. But those three are always outside the castle every game. You then randomize the rest of the tiles and lay them out face down in a pattern based on how difficult you want the game to be. Now, the base game comes with a number of maps split over three different difficulty levels, with the expansion adding even more. You also pick what level you want the final fight to be by picking a meteor from strength one to three. Now, this is placed on the appropriate spot on the map. With both of these sliders, right, like two different things you can adjust, this gives you a really wide range of challenges and difficulty levels which makes this a great game to grow with. Mm -hmm. So if you've got little ones, you can start things off easy and the game can get harder as they grow. Or if you want to break it out for grown up game night, you can dial it up for that. And once you got the board set up, players make their characters, which my kids think is the best part of the game. This starts by grabbing a character sheet and then drawing or coloring in your character. There are boy and girl presenting sheets and they're pretty fleshed out, but easy enough to draw over with a marker or soft or pencil. Next, you're gonna name your character, which you can do on your own, but the game actually provides a die drop table with male and female sounding names. And this is actually the first time I think I've ever seen a die drop table used in a board game and I love it. Finally, players can create heraldry for their characters. Now, I'm going to bet that a lot of listeners may not be familiar with what a die drop table is, as they are a bit niche, and as you pointed out, rarely used in board games. Now, a die drop table is a graphical tool that allows the location of where the die lands to determine what set of values the number on the die represents. Now, once everyone's made their characters, you place the character sheet into the two-layer character board, which are designed to hold the sheet between the layers, as well as give players a place to store their health counters and equipment. Now, each character starts with five health and one gold and one pull from the item bag. Now, the item bag is a big part of what makes Chronicles of Avil cool. In the bag is a mix of helmets, shields, weapons, and potions, each type having its own unique shape. So a sword feels different from a helmet. Now, when you need to pull an item from the bag, you say a short chant that lasts about five seconds, during which you can feel around to try to find the item type you want. When the chant ends, you have to pull your hand out and you're stuck with whatever you got. This feel mechanic is one of the real fun mechanics of the game, mm -hmm. though I am certain there are going to be some folks out there who may find it challenging with certain forms of nerve damage or dexterity limitations that might impede this mechanic from working as ideally for everybody. Yeah, so be aware of that if you are looking to purchase this game, that touch is required to fully enjoy it. Now, your character board has room for one helmet, one sword, and one shield. Any excess equipment, gold, and potions need to be stored in your pack, which is another cool part of the game, because due to using a two-layer board, the pack is actually set into the board, and you can fit as much stuff into your pack as you can physically fit the cardboard tokens on the board without stacking anything. Like Tetris, but without regular shapes. Mm -hmm. These are more oblong, rounded forms than nice, neat cubes. Yes. Now, when done creating characters, everyone places their meeple on the castle and the game starts. Now, each round, players are going to take turns taking two actions. After all players have gone, the moon token advances towards becoming the new moon. With each advance, either monsters respawn or players gain one health. Once the token hits the end of the track, the game end game is triggered. Not the end of the game, but like the end game. 
Meteor token is flipped over. Some new monsters are going to spawn, and the beast is added to the board, which is a nice tall 3D token that you put out. Now, from this point on, at the end of every turn, every monster, including the beast, will advance towards the castle. If any of them get into the castle, the players lose. So in many ways, the sort of standard tower defense progression. You've mm -hmm. got your prep time, and then the monsters make their way in to test what you've built up. And... Now, the actions the players can take include resting to get two hearts back, moving one hex, revealing a new hex, uh, like flipping over a new hex if you move on to a face down one, attacking a monster that's already on a hex, or interacting with the hex they're on. And only two actions doesn't leave a lot of time to experiment when that meteor is on its way. Now, most hexes contain wandering monsters, and these come in two different difficulty levels, small and large, represented by how big the tokens are. Now, monsters are further split into three colors, which affect how the player's equipment works on them without getting into too much detail. Now, hexes without monsters include useful sites where you can take actions like buying items, which gives you a pull from the bag, selling items by putting them back in the bag and getting some coins, upgrading the items you already own, which makes them way more powerful, placing walls around the castle. Each wall will prevent one monster from moving into the castle once, buying traps you can use against the beast, and more. And remember, it's a random layout, so you can only plan so much. Now, one rule I really like, and that adds to the family-friendly nature of this game, is that the monsters never attack the characters. It's always up to a player to initiate combat, and you can freely move around or pass monsters on the board. Now, this has the advantage of the game not requiring a GM player or any AI for the bad guys. Until the final round, they literally just sit there waiting to be attacked. And even in the final round, the only thing you need to do is they move one spot toward the castle every round and every move has to be closer. Think of it as them resting, waiting to be awoken by the meteor. It's actually pretty thematic. Fair. Totally true. Now, combat in Chronicles of Avil is dice-based and pretty straightforward. Every hero starts with two green dice used in combat. They can earn additional red attack dice, blue defense dice, or yellow magic dice through upgrading their equipment. Now, non-upgraded equipment earns players either automatic hits or defenses against a specific color of monsters or re-rolls that can be used once per combat. Now, each baddie shows a set number of black or purple dice on them. When attacking, you roll all your dice and the bad guy dice together and check the results. Swords and claws do damage to the monsters or you respectively. Shields and broken swords cancel these out. The magic yellow die also has a symbol that can count as either a sword or a shield. Now, after all the canceling out is done, you and or the monster take damage for any leftover swords or claws. Now, each combat action allows you to fight three rounds of battle with the option to start stop at any point. You can retreat after one roll, or you can go through all three, or you can fight two rounds. It's nice that not you or the monster, but that you and the monster can mm -hmm. both be taking damage. It's combat, not just a single swipe of your sword. Yes. Now, players have five health and are stunned, not killed. There's no player death in this game. And wake up in the castle with no gold and short one piece of equipment, but at full health due to the health stone, the thing you're guarding in a bell. Now, monsters have set hit points on their chits, and damage actually carries over between attacks, which you don't see often in these fantasy games. Now, when a monster is defeated, it's removed from the board, and you get the reward shown on the token. These often include equipment pulls from the bag, but can also include gold or being able to upgrade your gear. So it's important your balance to want to attack versus your need to upgrade while you can before that meteor strikes. Now, play continues with players moving around, using sites, buying and upgrading gear, placing traps, fighting wandering monsters, etc., until the meteor crash happens. Now the focus shifts to defeating every monster on the board, including the beast, who starts off with a ton of health and uses every bad guy die in the box when fighting. If players manage to defeat all the baddies, they win, but if even one makes it into the castle, you lose. Well, now that we've got a good idea of how to play Chronicles of the Vell, what did your family think of this cooperative board game? Well, Chronicles of Avil has been a hit since the first time it hit our game table. Every time has been enjoyable. Everyone who plays, including adults, seems to be hooked right away just by having to draw their characters and heraldry. 
So it's this part of the game that does lead me to my first complaint, and that's the character sheets. Now, you get a nice thick pad of these, but there are a couple issues. First, the sheets are only one-sided, and they swap between girls and boys. Girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. Well, this is great if you always want to play an even split of genders. When you don't, you end up having to tear off sheets just to get to the ones you want. Now, I know I have tons of double-sided score pads. I think a Doodle Dungeon with its huge map pad, and I can't imagine that it's that much more cost to print two-sided. And I'm really surprised they didn't do that here with the male-looking characters on one side and the female characters looking on the back. Or even better, why have male and female looking? Just go with androgynous characters on all the sheets, and then you don't have to worry about it. Indeed, it's certainly an odd choice. Any number of solutions could avoid this sort of waste. Now, the next problem is the amount of detail in the graphics already in the sheets. When reading the rules, I was expecting to see a faint outline or an armature to draw over. Instead, you've got a fairly dark, fully detailed character that are already all armored up. I didn't expect that at all. And everyone I played with has noted this would be so much cooler if it was much more open to customization. Now, that said, this is nothing a set of markers or heavy use of a pencil can't fix. I just thought it was an odd choice for a game that encourages you to, to draw your character. Um, I guess it, perhaps that they're allowing for a market that isn't quite as eager to draw in every details as your daughters certainly are, but it is sort of... A, it, there, there's a balancing point, and they, they mm -hmm. just went too far even for that market, I think. I think so too. Like, it, like honestly, the way it's done, and the rules should almost just say color your character, because the character is pretty much done. But you know what? We had fun drawing over top. Now, once you do have your character drawn or colored, uh, or you just name it, the rest of the player board system is brilliant. I love the way they created these two layer boards out of two separate pieces, and how you put them together to hold everything in place. And more brilliantly is even the way they tied this into the inventory system for different types of equipment, slot specific into specifically shaped areas so they don't slide around. And you actually have to get everything to physically fit in your backpack to be able to carry it. Every game we played has had at least one player sitting there fiddling with their pack between turns, trying to fit in one more coin or that potion they just picked up. Indeed, I think the physicality of this game is its strongest standout mm -hmm. feature. Now, another aspect of characterization that we had more fun with than I expected is that die drop table. Now, this is a thin sheet of thin card, not paper, but card that you put into the box lid. Now, on it are the various constellations of Avel. Uh, you then drop a green and a black die into the box and look where they land. Now, each constellation has part of a character name tied to it for each side of the die. Now, the sheet for this is two-sided with male and female sounding names. And I honestly like this enough that I kind of want to steal it for other fantasy games. Like the next time we're going to start up a new character quest and hero quest, we're going to use this to name our characters. And I could even see doing it for Dungeons and Dragons or other RPGs, just stealing the dry, dry, die drop table from Avel to use in other games. It's interesting. And I actually went down a bit of a rabbit hole of die drop tables the other night. And it's sad to see them so underused. Uh, there, there's something I, I learned about back in the Google Plus days and Dyson Logos was making a bunch of them. So I am a huge fan of dry drop tables and I love seeing them for use here. Now, as for the actual gameplay, it's engaging right to the end. And I really enjoyed the mix of exploration, preparation and battles. The only thing that feels just a bit off is how little you can do in one turn, especially with movement only being one hex. You're going to find that many turns are spent moving just so you can do something next turn. And it always feels like, like I just want to do the thing. Okay, I'm going to move here, but then next time it's my turn, I'm going to buy the wall, and then I'm going to move here, and then next time it's my turn, I'm going to do a thing. Now, to help with this, there are shortcut tiles. Now, these are tiles that count as adjacent, even if they're not next to each other. But the problem we found is that purely by luck, every time we have played, they end up next to each other anyway. So you're not really saving a lot of detail. Like, I almost wonder if there's a way to pull one out to put in later or something, some system to make sure they're more spread out. Now, that said, there is one item in the promo pack that will help with this, but I'll get to the expansion content a bit later. And I expect if this game goes over well, and I don't see much reason it shouldn't, then we might even be able to look forward to more expansions in the future. I know I would be excited if they were announced. Now, combat is quite fun. I described it above, but it can be highly random. 
Now, this randomness is greatly mitigated by getting your characters equipped as soon as possible. You want to get that helmet, that shield, that sword. Now, most of the items start off good only against set monster colors. And using that to your advantage will greatly enchant increase your odds of winning. And it's also worth upgrading as much of your equipment as you can because each upgraded piece gives you permanent dice. Whereas the basic equipment can only be used once per battle, the permanent dice are used every roll in the game. The ability to back off in the middle of a fight is also interesting because it can lead to some tactical choices, especially with that rule of only being able to use your equipment once per battle because you could go in, start a fight, fight one round, retreat, and then you use your second action to attack again and all your equipment will be reset. So not only fun for the family, but some real tactical thinking can mm -hmm. come into play as well. They haven't limited it and made it so kid friendly that it becomes adult unfriendly. Yeah, once we get into my final thoughts, that's definitely one of the things I will be bringing up that this one's as fun for adults. Now, one thing that does set this cooperative game apart from other cooperative games we played uh, with the kids like Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters or Disney Sidekicks is that Avel can be quite easy to win especially with the default map and easy difficulty, the, the level one on the meteor. That said, even on the easy game levels, like the, the simplest game, it always felt tense, even though it was pretty clear we'd have to roll absolutely horribly to fail. And I think that's just because of the nature of the game with the whole build up and get ready angle. No matter how much you've done, that turn when you flip that meteor over and repopulate the board and put the, the beast out just feels tense. And then swapping to normal and hard difficulty adds two more monsters, up to two more monsters on the board. So I got to say, swapping, swapping that meteor from level one, two, three didn't do a lot to make the game feel much more difficult. Now, what does really change the difficulty is the different maps. And the main thing that amps up the difficulty is how close the beast is to the castle. In the basic game, it's three squares away. In the hard game, it's two squares away. And in the really difficult game, it's one square away. So the available dials really have significantly different impacts mm -hmm. in how they adjust the game from a, a coarse, you know, easy, medium, hard to a sort of more subtle uh, yeah. change. Now, an aspect of the game I didn't mention during my summary is that Chronicles of Avel comes with a separate booklet that includes a short story as well as descriptions of all the creatures you'll run across. Now, my youngest daughter loved the fact this was included in the game. Our first time playing, every time we pulled out a new wandering monster, she read out loud the entry for that monster. Now, once later playing with both kids, they would actually argue over who got to read the book next and which monster and whose turn it was. And I really like the non-standard fantasy setting with many familiar creatures with their own unique twists and some really cool new types of baddies, including an entire mushroom-based faction. I mean, I think the Goombas might argue with how original mushroom factions are, but it is always great to see products like this diverge from elf, dwarf, orc, dragon material into that, you know, that so many just sort of automatically default into. I will admit there are goblins. I, I think they had to have put goblins in. Though if I remember, there's a goblin in each of the factions because they, they were the generic monster. Now, one thing I did try in regards to Avil was to play it just with adults. And I'm happy to say that while this game is aimed at kids, similar to Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters, it can be just as much fun for adults. Now, we played with Tori and Kat, and Tori in particular was smitten with it. He would have bought a copy online on the spot if it was available to purchase. He loved it that much. He also thought this would be a great game his mother would enjoy as she enjoys lighter, less thinky games, but likes engaging games with stories. Now, this leads me to say, I think not only is Chronicles of Avil a great cooperative game for playing with kids and the whole family, but it's just a great cooperative game. Though I think some might consider Tori just a big kid, but <laughs> I assume Kat agreed with him. Yes. Actually, they made that comment that night that, 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 that uh, I don't know if it counts because we're all kind of big kids anyway. I think most gamers have at least a little bit of that in. Now, earlier I mentioned that we received Chronicles of Avil in a bundle, which included three things in addition to the main game. And I want to talk a bit about each before I share my overall thoughts. So the first was a set of stickers for the Meeples. 
this is a nice to have, but in no way, absolutely not necessary. Um, what was neat is it did include two sets of st stickers for each meeple, one that looked male, one that looked female. So you do get to kind of pick your gender, but you only get to do this once because these don't come off. I would have loved to have gotten another set of meeple as well, so I could just make a big box full of all the possible combinations, but I get it. They really have made some interesting choices about gender representation, though I guess most families would probably set up the copy for their, their family and mm -hmm. be okay with it. Uh, not everyone has the wide variety of playgroups or has to account for public play. Yeah, that's it. actually what it ends up doing is I, we made three females and one male. Next is the Adventurer's Toolkit. Now, this is an oddly shaped expansion. It's kind of flat and long, and it's in like a wrap instead of a box that ends up being just three punch boards and a set of rules for how to use the new stuff on them. Now, the stuff includes a new item type, boots, which have their own unique shape to, that you can feel in the bag, that give characters re-rolls at the basic level and more movement once you upgrade them. There's three new potion types. There's three new hex tiles that get mixed in with the rest and three new large monsters, which are three demonic sisters and rules for familiars. You get the familiars by defeating the sisters. There's also 3D cardboard ballista figures, which are one of the things you can purchase on the new tiles. Now, once built, these fire at the start of each round, dealing damage to monsters on their hex or one hex away. This is actually the only way to do a ranged attack in the game. It's a cool addition. Honestly, this is a fantastic expansion that I don't see any reason you shouldn't pick up if you're picking up the core game. Like, I just recommend this one straight out. My only complaint is that this is a separate purchase. Like, to me, all of this just should have been in the main box, especially since the, the, the boots, because you can tell there's a spot for boots on your character card, and you know they pre-planned it. There was obviously designed to fit them. I think this is a really nice expansion. It's not much, but it seems like it would be too much stuff to include yeah. in the main box right off the bat and make the game just that much more difficult to handle learn, especially for the younger audience. So it lets you get used to the game before adding in these new features. That's fair enough. Like, like most of these do break the original rules in some way. So fair, I can see it. Now, finally, we have the Heroes Treasure promo pack. Uh, this is very small. This is a little tiny promo pack, smaller than a card, that contains one punch board with three new items that you just toss into the bag and rules for using it. Now, each of these features a new shape, so it's easy to confuse with the rest of the curves in the bag. Now, there's a stone that lets you reroll green dice. Note, this is something in your inventory that lets you get a reroll, which is neat. A warp crystal that you can drop on the map that connects to all the other shortcuts I mentioned earlier. So another way to spread out those shortcuts. And the gold pouch, which I just thought was so cute because it lets you stack gold on it, saving you room in your pack instead of having to spread it all out. All three of these are cool. Um, both mechanically and just to put more stuff in the bag. So I do appreciate that. As a promo pack, it's just a nice, fun thing to have, but in no way necessary. Mm -hmm. More of a thank you for jumping on the Apple train. Now, looking at everything as a whole, I, I honestly had no idea what to expect when I review, agreed to review Chronicles of Apple. Uh, when first contacted, I, of course, did some research. I looked up the game and I'm like, oh, that art is really fantastic. And it looks like a unique unique world and then i read the bag pulling inventory system and that alone was enough to convince me to try it i uh, years ago my kids had a game called laundry jumble where they had to reach into a laundry bin and pull out different types of fabric and i was reminded of that and how much my kids love that and i'm always looking for a game our entire family should enjoy so while it's not that i expected the game to be bad but I didn't expect it to be nearly as good as it actually is. I, there's no way I could have anticipated how much we would enjoy this game. Chronicles of Avil is a solid cooperative board game. Features fantastic artwork, a cool, unique fantasy setting, engaging mechanics, and excellent component quality. The bag-based equipment system is just as much fun as I hoped, and the adventures feel tense even when you're doing well. While the game may seem easy at first, which I honestly think is great for playing with younger kids, there are ways to ramp up the difficulty to challenge even experienced cooperative game players. So who's this game for? Who should be rushing out to grab it? And who maybe not so much? Everyone should know. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're a fan of cooperative game, if you're looking for a cooperative fantasy adventure game, the entire family can enjoy together. I don't think you can go wrong with this one. This is even one I think younger, early grade school kids will be able to grasp and enjoy, 
yet is more than engaging enough for adults to enjoy. And that's honestly the biggest surprise to me with Chronicles of Avil is just how much fun a group of four adults had playing this game clearly marketed to families and kids. Honestly, if you're a cooperative game fan, even if you don't have kids or don't plan on playing with kids, you should check this game out. It's not only a great cooperative family game, it's just a great cooperative game. Though with adults, I do suggest jumping to at least the medium difficulty maps after your first learning game to make it more of a challenge. Now, if you don't like cooperative games at all, I don't think Chronicles of Avil is going to win you over. It has the same issues you're going to find in most cooperative games, including a big potential for quarterbacking. Um, and there's nothing really in this system at all to mitigate quarterbacking. Um, it follows the usual formula of everyone does a thing, then something bad happens. And really, except for the cool bag building mechanic, there's nothing really totally new here. You're not going to discover a brand new, you know, this isn't the first deck builder or something. Maybe it'll be the first touch and feel pull from a bad game and start a whole trend. That'd be kind of neat. But for, for experienced gamers, I don't think you're, you're missing out on anything, especially if you don't like co-op games. Now, I do have one final recommendation, one Sean mentioned earlier, and that is if you do pick up this game, if you do think of picking this game up, I strongly think it's worth getting that bundle deal where you get the expansion and the promo pack. I, and the stickers. While the game doesn't feel incomplete without them, the, everything adds to the game in a significant and rewarding way. I really think, especially the expansion, if you can only get one, go for the expansion. If you can only get two, get the, get the promo pack and leave the stickers to the side. Those, they're nice to have. Well, that's it for our review of Chronicles of Avel from Rebel Studio. When you have the time, I invite you to also check out the written review over at Tabletop Bellhop. Dot com. And we should apologize now for switching between Avil and Avel because we were both back and forth. I was trying. Yeah. And to me, when I saw it was Avel, but then we watched a video and found out it's Avil. Yep. So. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Okay, so we made up for the lack of game playing over the last month in this last week with multiple game nights and multiple games played, starting with Aqualin. So every time we play Aqualin, D kicks my butt. Every time D and Gwen play, Gwen usually kicks D's butt. Well, Gwen wanted to see what it was like playing with me. And somehow we broke the logical pattern here and I kicked her butt twice. So I don't know if it's a rock, paper, scissor thing or something. <laughs> uh, obviously different people play this game differently and that is greatly affects how you play in 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 reaction to them and gwen kept saying that she's like i have never mom's never put one out in the middle she always uses it to block and you keep putting things out in the middle she's like i think you put a block just so that you could slide something to hit it and i'm like yes i did <laughs> she's like well i've never seen that before i never even thought of that so so it obviously impacted it uh, she was embarrassed because she she thought she was all that and unde well not undefeated. He had beat her a couple times, but I actually think it's good. Like I think this is a good thing that there are different ways people can play and how much that impacts your ability to play and the tactical nature of having to adapt your strategy to who you're playing with. To me, that's that's one of those good signs in an abstract strategy game. Indeed, it seems like play style is just as much a part of the game as pure tactics mm -hmm. and it's definitely one the more you play the more you realize things you can do which i do think is a, is again a highlight of the game now friday night tori and cat came over for the first time this year and we managed to squeeze in three games so first up was our first all adult game of chronicles of avil which as i mentioned during a review segment went over really well like tori literally stopped the game after about turn two or three or four and was like on his phone. He's like, you can't get this, can you? <laughs> I'm like, no, unfortunately you can't. It's still coming. It's like, oh, I really want to get it. I, I was honestly shocked by how much fun we had. And I really do think a group of adults could have a great time with this game, even if they took it more seriously than us. I honestly think a certain local group of gamers who take things way too seriously would still have fun with this game. I'm just picturing that. Sorry, because I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. 
it's interesting. I was actually just reading through comments on Board Game Geek about this game, and uh, they're really high. Although everyone is saying, you know, kids, 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 and I think these are a lot of yeah. Yeah, they're well, hard board games. That's definitely where it's targeted. At. Um, my my favorite is someone who gave it a three because it doesn't come with shoes. I, <laughs> that's literally their I, reasoning I, for getting a three. I, I can kind of see it, except that's playing the system wrong. But I did feel that was like like put the boots in the main game at least. Give me the the ballista are weird enough. Yep. That it but the, but the boots are like like I'm missing boots. Obviously, I can see like the fact you can see it. Yeah. Is a little annoying. What uh, I don't know is how much the expansion costs, which I didn't want to mention in the review. But I can't find an MSRP. Right. Like they're they're like looking at their website. There's no maybe that's a Polish thing. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, I think the yeah. tactile aspect is really great. And I love tower defense. Yeah. Uh, my question again, though, is how many plays is a group of adults going to get out of it? Sure, it's fun. I mean, absolutely. You, you yeah. get a couple of you get a couple of fun plays, uh, even at the hard level. But I, I don't know how often it would come out after you've had a couple of plays. And as Dee is saying right now, she loved playing with the kids, but doesn't really need to play it again with adults. Yeah, she doesn't like cooperative games though so that's i think true. that's a big thing <laughs> there is that where, where i'm like yes it, it plays the same every time but like people play pandemic how many times in a row and people play horrified and and uh, i don't know i i i'd be willing to play it again with adults no problem i if we were doing public play events i'd be bringing it out i'm definitely not sick of it at this point that's fair so i, I again it's going to depend on the group i think you have to like co-op games like that that's the one key and you can't have a power gamer because I admit it was hard with the kids. And and I will say Gwen got upset one time because we kept trying to help her. Right. Like we were like, and she's like, I'm going to go do this. And I'm like, but that doesn't help us. Remember, we're working together. <laughs> right. Like if you go that and then I got to make Gwen kind of got the well, If you think I have to go over here and build a wall, I'll go over here and build a wall. And I'm like, oh, we quartered back her, and I kind of felt bad. Yeah. But it's cooperative, and I'm like, but what are you doing? And then I'll admit my other kid just wanted to explore every tile and ran around, and we tried to talk her out of it, but she's more strong-willed and <laughs> did it anyway. So, right. Yet we still won, so that's another indication of it. I, I got to say that the difficulty, um, like I, I did the three difficulty on the Meteor just didn't make enough impact. Like it really did. Well, and that's what I like. I, I pointed that out during the review. I think it's interesting that you've got two different, you've got a yes. fine and a course, in, you know, you, you've got the mm -hmm. maps, which make these big jumps in difficulty, whereas the meteor adjustment is just a tiny little tweak <laughs> left or right on that adjustment scale. And and a comment to the person who left a three, wait till you buy the expansion <laughs> where you have to scan a QR code because they failed to include the instructions for how to set up the map with the expansion files. Ouch. I don't know. It's like a big sheet that you can download that's as big as the box which I don't know if it was supposed to be in the original box. And well, that obviously won't fit on that small expansion. Right. So you literally have to go online to get maps mm. for the expansion, which I, again, I didn't feel was necessary to call out, but was a little annoying. Fair. All right. Next jump in, leaving a, a vel in, in the pile of will never be played again in our house. Possibly now uh, the kids <laughs> like it enough. I'm sure they'll do it. And, and my kids are old enough. They'll play it on their own. Um, next, we introduced Tori and Kat to Lost Ruins of Arnak. Um, I think I oversold it at first, and I didn't realize this, but Kat does not like worker placement games. Back when she was 19, the first game night she came out to, I taught her a worker placement and she hated it. She doesn't remember what game it was. I don't remember this even happening because back then I wouldn't have known her to know for, from anyone else. Um, so she was scared. Um, Tori was also hesitant, but like, You've seen the board. You've seen the the pile of to well. You don't really see the pile of tokens, but you can tell there's piles of tokens on it. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen the cards. I've seen the unboxing. I know. Yeah. I, I you know I've seen this and I've seen the the photos on BGG of the layout. Yeah. It's an imposing game. Yeah, it is, exactly. It is seriously, a lot of oh my god, what is going on in front of me? Yes. And then you have the whole you start playing and they're like, well, what do I do? And I'm like, it's up to you. Because that's kind of what that game's like. You're like, I don't oh. know what you should do. And now I played it enough times, I can at least say, well, you can kind of work on this path here. You can do this, or you can try to buy cards, or you can work towards artifacts, but you really do want to explore. That's the one thing I've learned is you, you. I don't think you can win a game if you don't start getting those idols for exploring. And it's not just to unlock the spies. Those idols are way too useful. Yep. So anyway, they were intimidated by, for, at first, but like by round three, both of them were like, oh, no, this is good. Like, like they were doing that. Oh, no, you were right. 
Because I'm like, this is probably the best game I played since Terraforming Mars. And everyone knows how much I love Terraforming Mars. And I started with that. And they were like, oh, work replacement. I don't know. But yeah, we 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 had convinced her or convinced them that, that they were sold. And while Cad is like, okay, worker placement games can be fun. Um, and I'm like, man, now I need to show her more worker placement games. Because like Terrifying Mars, I know she loves, but that's not worker placement. And I, was, I still want to know which one I taught her. So this was the four, first four-player game physically. Closest game ever. 64 to 63 to 62 to 54. And Tori took the win. And thankfully did not do the Tori thing of, I won so much I don't have to play again. Because it was that close, right? So he didn't feel like he crushed us and never needs to play again um now i know board game geek has this list as best at three but it it felt solid with four i i didn't like we played enough three player games online that i don't see how four is worse than three in any way um one neat thing that happened i had never seen before and part of why i liked it at four is every single one of the mid-level exploration sites the the, the first level were filled like there was full option of what is it, eight spots to go to and three of the four ones at the top were there, which meant in those last two rounds of the game, there were so, so many options. It was fantastic. Of course, it did lead to some AP, but I think everyone was suffering from the same amount of AP. So it's not like it was a problem. Yeah, I, I really feel like I've been missing out not playing this physically, mm-hmm. and, I, and I can't wait to fix it. Uh, at least the teach should be easier with all the time I've spent yeah, on VGA. It shouldn't take that much work. I, mean, I think I would call myself proficient at teaching that game at this point. I've now played enough and taught it to enough different people. Now, the last thing we did Friday night, and this may be the one people in the chat are most interested in, or our listeners are most interested in, is we finally started our Charterstone campaign. That was interesting, because what an oddly designed start of a game. Um, You have a mostly empty rule book with tons of gaps and... Like, I don't remember having the issue with Risk Legacy or Pandemic Legacy, where this just felt like I didn't have enough stuff. Like, there's just really no onboarding, and it just feels kind of odd, but then kind of neat because everyone's in the same boat, kind of going, what is this? What are we doing? Um, It has, you set everything up, right? Like, you're going to put the board out, and then you're going to open this box, and this box contains your components, right? And then you're going to take your components, you're going to put them out, and it involves cool stuff, like actual metal money. Like, there's mm-hmm. some really impressive stuff in these boxes. And then you're like, pick a charter, and base it on where you're sitting compared to the board. And and I'm like, okay. And honestly, like, Gloomhaven did this. You're basically picking based on the color and the symbol. And then you open it up and find out, like, like Cat's the pumpkin lady. Like, all her stuff is around pumpkins my person ended up being around clay but like you had no information on this you just kind of like all right um then you literally start putting stickers on a map and and people were like oh, i want to put a sticker on the map i don't know what i'm doing yet but you put stickers on the map and then it tells you how to place your workers and activate spots and then basically goes go um the only thing it tells you is don't read further until someone goes to this special spot called the charter stone to open the crate on their building card, they just peeled their sticker off. Because again, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm being fairly vague. So it's like, just start playing. And while everyone was kind of nervous, which I honestly think was unwarranted, like everyone was way too worried that they were going to do something wrong. I'm going to put the sticker in the wrong spot, and it's going to ruin the campaign. Now, personally, I think what we were doing here isn't going to matter all that much by the time we get the game three, four, five, twelve, whatever. Um, we're in for the long run. I think now it's just a chance to like, here, get used to putting stuff on the board, get used to putting your meeple out. Look, you're collecting resources. I think based on the previous legacy games you've played, yeah. I can completely understand the hesitance, even if in this case, it may have been unwarranted. I mean, imagine, I, you know, games like Gloomhaven, where if you put the sticker in the wrong place, you're up the creek. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Rip up the wrong card. I don't yeah. know. There's, so far, there has been no destruction. So that's worth noting. No, I don't know if that might change. But like Kat was so scared of she's like, I don't want to put my sticker in the wrong place. And I screwed. I put up a sticker upside down. Thankfully, it peeled off pretty well. <laughs> uh, so far, the gameplay itself is very simple action selection. Um, I know everyone wants to call it worker placement, but to me, a worker placement game, you have to block the spot. If I'm on it, no one else can take it. So to me, that's not worker placement. 
that's action selection. I am picking that action. And I have two workers to pick actions from. I know that that's such a a a weird, you know, argue about worker placement. But anyway, you have you have two people. And what it uses is the euphoria system, because that's also Stonemeyer. That's why I say that. So you're gonna either place a worker or take all your workers back. And at this point, we have two and one's bigger than the other, and there's no reason. So that's always interesting. Um, there's six charters, and well, each charter specializes in a different resource. So there's six resources. Um, you've got a spot to trade in your resources for goals, or gold, sorry, gold. Um, there's end, not end game scoring, but goals to achieve. Like uh, you shuffle a deck, it gave you five of them, I think, to start. And we had have six gold, have a good of each type. And I don't remember what the third one was. It's probably the one I didn't actually achieve. Um, that you can try to do. There's a way to ship goods, which none of us, the entire game, shipped any goods. <laughs> um, once you unlock that crate, so slight, very slight spoiler. It's all in game one. Uh, it, it gives you buildings to build and unlocks a whole building building. So now you finally have a reason for the resources you're collecting. Because up until that point, a pumpkin was no different than a, than a, than a, than a brick. Um, the game was very much a point salad. Like most of those actions gave you points for doing things. Um, then there's like, instead of getting points, you would get reputation. And that was area majority where the person with the most rep at the end of the game got 10 points. Uh, so far, it just kind of feels like a generic gateway Euro with a bunch of Euro mechanics, like your, your action selection, you're placing workers, you're collecting resources, trading the resources and building things as well as an area control. Like it's all just stuff we've all seen before. And honestly, that's not a bad thing. Now, the one thing I'm really, really curious about is it basically said everyone should unlock that crate. And once we saw what the crate did, you get buildings and you get this other thing that's going to start in the next game and it's all tied together. So, so your charter kind of gives you a theme. Well, D chose not to unlock her crate. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Now in the first game, you get to carry over your stuff, but if she doesn't unlock the crate next game, she loses the cards. And I don't know if that like could ruin your whole game because she'll never get buildings. Like I, I have no idea. So that's going to be interesting because Deanna is just kind of like, well, the game wants me to do this. Screw that. I'm not doing that. Well, it's certainly a risky choice from the sounds of it. I'm almost sad you guys aren't streaming this one, but I'm sure we'll hear all about it here to follow along. Oh, yeah. I, I, we, we could stream. I, I worry we would have a hard time being PG because we got used to not streaming our, our games on Friday nights. It would take some work to get us back to being good little boys and girls. Uh, next up. Deanna and I finally tried Quacks of Quedlinburg with Herb Witches, and wow, is it good. Like, like there is nothing bad about this expansion at all. I love everything about this. Um, you got a brand new ingredient, local weed, which does some cool stuff. Uh, you got two different varieties of local weed. You got improved pumpkins, which, I don't know, six pumpkins. Uh, two new varieties of all of the existing ingredients. Now, remember when we bought the expansion for... for um, Imhotep, or like you now have 10, 28 possible combinations. I have no idea what Quax is up to, but it's ridiculous because there's now six different options for all of the basic ingredients that can be combined with every other ingredient in six different options. Like it's got to be in like the billions at this point of possible combinations for ingredients. And then you get the herb witches themselves, which you, you have three witches. Actually, I'll get to those in a second. So, so we played two games. I want to talk about the recipe books first. So we, we played two games. And we played with all the five sides of the recipes. I guess we'll call it sides. And then the six sides of the recipes. And while we flipped the local weed over. And while the pumpkin just, there's a new version of pumpkin. And what I like to see was so many more luck mitigation ingredients. There was a lot more pull a thing out and put it aside, but you have to use it later. Or if this is after that, get a thing. Um, another one that I found was fascinating is a whole bunch that gave you stuff in the middle of pulling being um, points or rubies. So it's like, if this was placed after this, get a ruby in the middle of the round. So that was a, a game changer. Um, there was something that there was more um, catch up mechanics. There were, there were things that let you double the rat tails you had and stuff like that. Just all things that honestly seem to fix issues I've seen us complain about or other people complain about with the original. And people seemed oddly excited about the giant pumpkins. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> Six pumpkins! I don't know. My Twitter feed went nuts. When yeah. I oh, they, they love those giant went, pumpkins. Went, 
went cuckoo when I started talking about giant pumpkins. We did not buy a single six pumpkin. Sorry, they cost twenty two, and with twenty two, it seemed like other stuff was better. Though I got to say, moving six. Oh, that's something I totally forgot in, in my notes here. So another thing it adds is the overflow pot. So now you can go past the spoon. Well, that's what that extra little thing was. Yes, okay. I actually completely forgot about it until just now while talking to you. There's now an overflow pot, so you can actually go past. And what happens is your ingredients go in there but don't do anything. and But then you add them up and divide them by two and get points. Okay. But it can still explode. So just adding the cherry bomb. So if you push it too far, you can still make your pot explode. What I love is this whole discussion here. You've talked about all this luck mitigation or all this luck mitigation things. And yet you had that horrible pull that you showed on your stream. It was, was that not terrible? Awful. Like, did you see how much was in my bag? It was ridiculous. Yeah, no, that was that was brutal. You had you just did not have a good pull. No, I, I, it's 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 randomness mitigation, not removal. <laughs> yep. Now, as for the witches, every game you're going to play with three witches, and there are four varieties of each witch type. So, so you're randomizing between four, and then randomize between four, randomize between four. And each of the witches seems to be themed to do different things, and they each have an ability that you're allowed to use once per game. And they track it, and you get a, you get a bronze coin, a silver coin, a gold coin, and each witch takes a different bribe. And that's just to show you've used it as you spend your coin. Um, those would have been awesome if they were metal. Um, the stuff they do was really cool. Um, there was one that was always based on buying ingredients as far as we saw, cause we tried two of the four and it was, you know, when you buy an ingredient, get an next one for free or when buying an ingredient upgrade to the next level, or you can purchase twice or something like that. Um, or discounts on buying stuff. There were ones that give bonus points and the bonus points ones seem to be based on what was in your pot. So it was like at the end of the round or at the end of any round, you could pay this witch off and you would get points based on how many different colors you had. Or then the next one was how many of the same color. So there was ways to get bonus points. And then the best one, in my opinion, was the one that was random mismitigation, which was stop and explode. Like if your pot explodes, you still get both things or put the last two cherry bombs back into your bag or things like that. And those were the two we saw was, was ignore explosions. But I noticed the blue witch was all had to do with not exploding or putting things back in. And again, I thought this was awesome because it offsets some of the randomness. And as Sean said, some of the randomness. Now, Deanna in particular liked this because she thought it greatly improved the game, like kind of fixed it. Uh, well, I always loved Quacks. I was the one that, that I was always pushing to play it. She didn't love it. She'd play it like, like hey, you want to play Quacks? Yeah, okay, I'll play Quacks. But like if Tori and Kat were coming, I'm like, let's play Quacks. She's like, well, couldn't we play Arnak or something else? <laughs> Adding in the Herb Witches, now Deanna can confirm this, seem to move it from a game she will play to a game she might sometimes want to play. Right? Like, I don't, I still don't think she's going to be like, Hey, you know what we should do tonight is play this. But I think it's going to be one that she's going to be much more willing to play. Well, I think that's uh, sort of the response we were most were expecting to hear. I'm glad to see the excitement for the expansion was well warranted. Oh yeah. And they didn't hurt an already really fun game. No complaints. Like, like nothing felt, broken or overwrought or it's a little more fiddly now because you have even more stuff to track but that's about it now deanna and i also tried out the snake side of the board in lost ruins of arnak and i have to agree with the threads we saw on board game geek this side does seem to be better balanced and definitely seemed to help with the runaway leader problem i was seeing in two player games previously i actually enjoyed this side of the board quite a bit more Though I have to say, I did totally mess up my last turn of the game, which cost me the entire thing. Like, up until that point, I was doing great. Might have even pulled off my first two-player win. But I messed up so bad, and you played Arnax, so you know how bad this is. I had to discard five cards at the end of the game with nothing I could do with any of them. Now, this was 100% my fault. Not a problem with the game or my opponent, but highly frustrating. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rough. Uh, it's good to know here that the difference is as advertised because uh, yeah. I know I'd run into that snake side solves problems uh, thread a number of times uh, in discussions. Now, my last game of the week was a Sunday game of Imperial Settlers over at Brenda's place. Um, I've been enjoying rediscovering this card driven sub building game, and it was cool to play a game with all four factions in play just to see how different they each play. Now, I played the Samurai this time, which is a factions whose buildings can be raised by themselves or their opponents. 
Um, they also added an end game scoring mechanic to the game, which I was a little too obsessed with because I managed to max out my end game scoring, but then it still wasn't enough to take the win. Uh, Deanna tried out the Egyptians for the first time, which of course were all about using workers to build with stone as well as hoarding gold. Now, Gwen tried the Romans, um, but felt she, she had some difficulty with it because they start off feeling underpowered. And honestly, they really are. They only have two workers. But once you get an engine going, they can be one of the most powerful factions in the game. And I just think for her learning the game, she started off frustrating and then didn't really recover later. Though she ended up, I think, coming in second place. Now, Brenda loved playing the barbarians, disrupting everyone else's deals, and raiding our civilizations every turn. So that went over well. Overall, I am really enjoying Imperial Settlers. I'm glad that we've rediscovered it, and we've had now had all the factions to the table. So we've now seen them all. I've relearned the rules, and I'm going to finally crack open my Atlanteans expansion that has been on my pile of shame since 2016, 2017, <laughs> far too long funny you're talking about this game again because 51st state keeps throwing up in my oh. in my mailbox all these, everyone's all these, going nuts over that i know uh, it, it's supposed to be better i know some people <laughs> like that one better odd though like you'd think i'd prefer post-apocalyptic for some reason civilization and farming to me you play a lot better. of heroes so. yeah <laughs> all right well how about a look ahead what do you have planned for the coming weeks all right so one of the things i did this past week was record 10 unboxing videos in a row Yes, that's 10 different unboxing videos. Um, I had packages show up from Free League as well as the Op the last week and cracked open those as well a few more of my holiday gifts. Uh, that's where Quacks came from, actually, was from the holiday gifts. So this means I've got lots of games to sit down and learn to play, games and expansions. Um, now, this Friday is Genevieve's birthday, and Tori and Kat are coming over. And one of our plans for the day is to play some party games with both kids and Tori and Kat. So get all six of us down there. So that my goal, uh, my, my self-serving goal is to get hues and cues out of the pile of obligation and played and telestrations as well. Now, what I don't know if I can toss in is the 90s, 80s cards with telestrations, but I'm not sure because I just think telestrations in general might be difficult for kids. But you know what? It's not about the score. So if I draw a, a wolf eating someone and the answer is supposed to be Duran Duran, hungry, write the wolf, it doesn't matter. They're going to see a picture of a wolf and write the word wolf. So it'll still work. So we may or may not try, toss that in. Now, what I'm hoping is the kids go to bed early enough that we can also get in our second game of Charterstone and we'll see if D finally opens a crate or decides to just keep going without it. So I think that'll be interesting. Other than that, who knows? Maybe it'll be like last week and we'll get in even more games, but that's my plans. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Pat and Tori, because they haven't been mentioned enough in this show tonight. <laughs> it just kind of worked out that way. I got to say thanks in advance for putting up with our kids on Friday. Hopefully it goes well. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, we haven't seen in the chat room for a while. I hope you're doing all right, Major Kayla. Sean P. Kelly of the excellent Gaming and BS podcast. Thank you. Sadly, I haven't been keeping up with them. I, I need to find time to. Are they still doing Monday nights? They're doing Mondays, but it moved to YouTube, and and I, I don't. Oh, I so I don't get notifications, notifications or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I haven't caught them in a while. Still dig the show. I assume it hasn't suddenly gone terrible. Uh, Andrew Daisy, thank you, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and since Ryan's not here, we can just lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find your pod, our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, because you can't find our podcatcher on your podcast. And sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. But you might be able to if you also use Pinecast. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Now, if you like the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts, uh, that would be awesome. But if you really want bonus content, head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. We give you bonus audio, access to a Discord channel, sometimes free games. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. 
and game, game on. on.